Welcome back to Trending in Education. Dan Straver, Mike Palmer along with you. And on today's episode, a very special look at a new documentary called Unlikely. And we have the producers, directors, creators of said documentary, Jay and Adam Fenderson on the line with us. I always like to check in first. Mike, I know you're excited. How excited are you? Uh, I, I can contain myself. I may not want to because uh, I, I really, really enjoyed the film uh, last night. I uh, would recommend it to all of our listeners. Uh, I was surprised by uh, how many topics that came up in Unlikely we had touched on and covered in different ways on on the show, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the Star- Starbucks uh, uh, college uh, admission plan. I forget exactly what it's called, but... Uh, achievement plan. Achievement plan, thank you. Uh, the I Promise School uh, was another one we talked about. Uh, we've... we've it, it, and and the the fact that those topics were covered in a very human and authentic way and uh was surfacing issues from a perspective that we try to adopt but but I really think this film nailed it so uh so I'll try to contain myself but not too much uh congratulations to uh to Jay and Adam for for really a wonderful um a wonderful project here and uh when we're recording this like it's 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 dropping like it's hot right now. So, <laughs> so welcome to the show, uh, both of you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah. Happy yeah. To be here. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. So, uh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, well, for Jay, Adam, for our audience, if you could give us a, you know, the short and sweet bio of, of how you came to be documentarians and, and what the focus of this film was. Maybe, uh, Jay, you first. Uh, we know uh, you sort of give a bio at the top of this film. Uh, could you give us a little bit of your background and then, Adam, uh, it would be great to hear from you as well. Yeah, for sure. So I was a low-income student. I went to uh, Columbia University, and even though I wanted to be a filmmaker and and work in, in film and television, uh, my first job out of college was actually, uh, I was a, a, a admissions officer at Columbia, and I took that job because the dean of admissions at the time, Eric Ferda, said, if you join our team, you can produce an undergraduate recruiting video. So <laughs> that was sort of what drew me in. And then once I worked in admissions, I realized, you know, a lot of the inequities there um, that exist. And for me, coming from a public high school background and, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about, you know, the test prep industry or, um, you know, just sort of the all of the intricacies of applying to college and what goes into it. And uh, so my eyes were opened and even though I left and moved to Hollywood, I couldn't shake the fact that, you know, there were some problems in higher, the higher education system that I thought could possibly be solved through storytelling and through media. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of jumped along. So I, I uh, grew up in California and I went to school here for film. Uh, I'm in California now, so that's why I said here. Uh, and we are, I, uh, I went to film film school and then started working in mostly reality television. Um, I met Jay. Jay had, after she left college admission, she sold a TV show called The Scholar, which was about a bunch of high school students vying for a full ride college scholarship. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she, I met her when she was producing that. Um, and we fell in love and decided to get married. And then we were like, we should make a movie too. And so we, we came up with this idea for First Generation, which was about, uh, students who were first in their families to try to go to college and mm-hmm. we followed them for a couple of years that movie came out um we got a lot of uh, traction in the education markets and then um got some great support and some tours some film screening tours and all along the way people were saying really the next story is completion it's not mm-hmm. just about students getting into college but getting through college and mm-hmm. although we were hesitant to start another educational documentary uh, we really did find those stories compelling. And so that's kind of how we we decided to start making Unlikely, um, which, like you said, is is coming out in theaters now. But by the time this comes out, it may already be out of the theaters um, that, that it's in right now, which is L.A. and D.C. But it's hitting theaters across the country in different places. So, uh, yeah, we're really excited to to be at that point now. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, you know, if you if our listeners want to learn more, it's uh, unlikelyfilm.com is the is the website to go That's to. That's it. You yeah. got it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and there'll be lots of updates around how this is coming out, probably uh, going digital, as all things tend to do uh, sometime in the <laughs> foreseeable future. So uh, consider this an initial uh, introduction to this this film. 
Uh, I imagine we're going to be hearing more about it, uh, and yeah. especially our audience who wants to understand where where the world of learning and education is going. Uh, I, I think uh, if you haven't heard about it already, you're hearing about it now, and you'll likely continue to hear about it because uh, it it really does. You know, you had you had really nice access to some impressive uh, folks, both the five students you covered. Uh, and then uh, the educational ventures and innovators who you worked with on the other side. And uh, one of the big, um, bigger ideas that came out of the film for me was the idea of 21st century higher education, mm -hmm. uh, where like a lot of the ideas around uh, what we all think about when we think about going to college or why universities exist are more centered around maybe older models uh, yep. and are also centered around, uh, we recently had uh, Michael Horn on the show who wrote uh, Cho uh, Choosing College. Mm -hmm. And um, that was also another really interesting one where he said, you know, yeah, there is a segment out there who chooses college because they want to go to the best school. Uh, and that's also where, you know, you talk a bit about Operation Varsity Blues and some of the other reasons why that is very uh, zeitgeisty. See, I warned you. <laughs> but, uh, but once, uh, once you sort of shift the perspective to the problem you were identifying before, that's when it got really interesting to me. So could you talk a little bit about like maybe that perspective uh, first? You know how the, the problem of say Varsity Blues is almost the wrong way to frame the problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'd love to hear, hear your, ta your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so, Operation Varsity Blues, when that hit the headlines, our film, we'd already premiered at festivals, and so we had another version of the film done, but then when we found out that we were going to be in theaters, uh, we talked about it, and we're like, we need to recut this, because everything in the media, you see the framing around talking about higher ed is so often about selective institutions, and you hear those stories in the spring where they're just saying, you know, eight, you know, one student got into all eight Ivy Leagues, as if right. that's you know, a newsmaker. And I think like something like Varsity Blues happens because there's this pressure that's put on students and families that they need to do whatever it takes to get into these certain schools, which, you know, there are 4,000 schools in our country. The, the pathways to college, there are, they're varied and they're different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this like intense focus. And so that puts pressure on, on students and families and the media you know, just, you know, makes that even worse. And mm -hmm. so what we wanted to do is sort of flip that on its head and shift the narrative. So, mm -hmm. you know, starting off with that, um, the Operation Varsity Blues, but really pointing to the fact that like, that's not a scandal, that's impacting the top 1%, a small minority of the top 1%. Mm -hmm. And that's not really having any impact on the inequality that we see in our country. And, and, and that's yeah. not who's going to college. I mean, the truth right. is like, we have this idea in our head that the people that are going to college look like an a, a, you know an 18 year old kid that's headed off and is like well i i'm i'm looking between you know stanford and yale and which mm -hmm. one's it going to be and like that is just such a small percentage of who of who's actually going to college and so you know we focus our film on the majority of the students the people that the the today's college students and so uh for the students that are in the film are you know what we would traditionally called non-traditional I guess right so it's like it's which is kind of a silly thing now because it's like 40 something percent of the students out there are not college age and right. so you're like you're looking at this um adult population students with kids and and what you were saying is like the, the 21st century college model like what are we looking at um these most of these students do not have the ability to just go sit in a classroom all day long um right. But the importance of a college degree isn't changing, right? It's not like, oh, well, you know, they just don't need a college degree anymore because there's all these opportunities with people that have no, no sort of training or college degree. And when we're talking about college, we, we, we constantly try to remember and talk to tell people that we are not talking about four year university bachelor degrees, right? Yes. And like, you know, beyond that, we are talking about some sort of post secondary. Um, community colleges are colleges. Let's stop this, like, <laughs> right, oh, well, right. everybody needs to go to college. Not everybody needs a four year degree. That's not what college is. Everybody needs post secondary. And so we, we look at these students that are you know, adults that are going back to school and what are those challenges and what are the solutions? Because mm -hmm. If we try to just fit them in the box that was built 
you know, 50 years, years ago, ago, 200 <laughs> years ago, we, right. they, they just don't fit in. And right. so we need to rethink Innovate. that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and just sort of with, with that in mind, like the problem that you, that you really identify uh, first and foremost is the completion problem, right? So like, yes. yeah. to, me, to me, like the way I was, you know, thinking about it, it's almost like, uh, you know, there's the people who opt out of going to college and you're not recommending that. I don't think any of us are necessarily saying don't go to college, but there, those folks are actually in better shape than the, the folks who start college and don't finish. So like we're exactly. always we're always seeing those questionnaires and uh, fortunately those of us who at least completed a bachelor's degree get to check off, oh, I completed a bachelor's degree or even an associate's degree. Right. But it's more some college and didn't complete. Yes. Because that opens up uh, a whole nother set of problems around uh, loans and even just their own sense of self-worth. Right. I'd love to hear exactly. hear hear y'all talk more about about that sort of problem space because it's kind of and it's a real problem in the U.S. because like right. we're 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 getting getting beat in the the yeah. global uh, landscape. So I'd, yeah. uh, thank you for teaching me that. But can you teach? <laughs> me that? I mean, I think so. We have this culture in America where we're telling people to go to college and we're encouraging everyone to go. But what's happened is now there are over thirty six million Americans who decided to go to college, but they have no degree, the some college, no degree segment. So I think what troubles me is that they were told that higher education pays off. Sarah Goldrick Robb has this great line in the film where she says, you know, they were told higher education pays off, but it didn't pay off. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to someone's psyche? What does that do to the children of those individuals who went to college? You know, it creates and it perpetuates a cycle that higher education is not worth it because mm -hmm you're not going to complete, it's too expensive. And now many of those individuals are burned with student loan debt. So that to me is the real issue of inequality in our country. And I think that a lot of those individuals who did try college, they didn't have the support structures in place because often they're coming from backgrounds where their parents and um, the people around them don't have a, a post-secondary experience. Mm -hmm. So they don't know how to tell them, you know, if you get a bad grade one semester or, you know, if you if you're having trouble, you know, going to class, how to overcome those things. If you, you know, owe three hundred dollars on your um, you know, your bill at the end of the semester, um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't register for classes, you yep. know, for the following semester. And so there are these really small obstacles that trip students up. And there's nobody else outside of, you know, their own, you know, um, their own knowledge, telling them that they can overcome those obstacles. And so right. I think that's where we have this issue. And um, I think institutions need to do a better job to help students overcome those hurdles. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the people, there's a lot of talk out there and we love that, you know, higher education is getting a, a, a place in the, the upcoming election. People, people are talking about it. People are talking about what the different solutions are. This week, because we're in DC, we've been doing this Twitter campaign or uh, Instagram campaign about, you know, what are these, um, you know, these potential new leaders talking about? What are they saying uh, about higher education? But I, I do think that we, one of the things that people talk about a lot is, you know, oh, we, we have people with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And those, there are, major problems with student loan debt and we need to really address that um but the people that have you know when you see people that that are graduating and on the top of their hat they're like seventy thousand dollars in student loan you're like i hope you got a degree that's worth seventy thousand dollars because a lot of degrees are worth seventy thousand sure. dollars and yep. that's good but the person that's not sitting next to you because they dropped out and they have yeah. twenty thousand dollars in loans yeah they're in way worse situation than you are because yeah. that person doesn't have anything that's going to help them get to pay off those loans. And so right. we really need to think about that. That comes back to the price of college. That comes back to how we're dealing with student loans. But it really does, we, we need to help them complete. Because if you have $30,000, which is about the, the, the typical loan amount, and you have a degree, you're in a much, much better state than somebody with even just $5,000 in loans mm -hmm. that they don't have, a, have anything to pay it off with. Yeah, and I, I was struck by that too. Uh, I, I, th I think it was uh, the student in, I, I think he was in Atlanta, where he was talking about, you know, small amounts of like, and he's like, I can't ask my, my parents, for, like, hey, can you float me 300 bucks this month? Right. Like that's, which is also like sort of the old school narrative of, you know, kid from college calling home and saying, hey, can you 
I guess, wire me if it's like an old yeah. school thing. But like, like that, he's just like, that's just not a conversation that I can have. And I, I was, I was watching this with my wife and that, that was really her experience growing up too. She's first generation, um, first, uh, you know, among the first people in her family who, who, who went to college and now, now she got her doctorate and like, just framing that as, um, not a boundary case, uh, right. to your point, Adam, it's more like that is the, that's an increasing percentage and yeah. an increasing percentage who is, is really getting disaffected about education just in general. So, um, so I think that sets the table, at least in terms of the, the problem state that, that, that you identified and, um, part of I, why I'm, Oh, that's sorry, that's the norm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's the norm. Those those are the majority of students in college now. It's the yeah. low-income students. It's students of color. It's students with backgrounds that look very different than the normal students that you think of. And if we are not supporting these students, if we're not changing the way that universities and, and community colleges and technical schools are run to support those students then we are hurting our country i mean right. we're straight up hurting these yeah. students and then if we don't give so then it, then you look at that segment and if they feel as if they they failed you know mm -hmm. the first time around and they don't have uh, the space to return to school um mm -hmm. what we call in our film comebackers mm -hmm. um that i too i think that is just like perpetuating the cycle of inequality and yeah. so i think that we need you know we Every uh, Tim Rennick has another great line where it's like, if you come from a middle or upper class family, if you encounter these obstacles, uh, you know, you have a second chance, you yep. know, it's never like the end of your story. And so we hope that people watch this film and are encouraged that, you know, they're, they can have a second chance. Like we should be a country of second chances yes. and, you know, giving people the opportunity that's never too late to pursue a degree, you know, ma yes. no matter your age or stage in life, like you can pursue a degree. Yeah. Tim has this line also in the film that he's talking about when he worked at Princeton and how, Princeton students, he's like, I saw lots of problems in Princeton's, not just like getting a C in a class, but like drug problems yes. and cheating. And you have these, they had these invisible support structures behind them, these, you know, uncles and lawyers and people, accountants and stuff that could help them. And they were graduating right alongside with everybody else. That's not the majority of our students. Right. Like those people have second chances. Yeah. Those right. people get second chances all the time. Well, and you yeah. even think of, to take it back to Operation Varsity Blues, I'm sure that all of those students, yeah. you know, the, despite <laughs> the fact that their parents, you know, were under federal investigation and some of them went to jail and all of this, they'll all probably still go to college. They'll probably right. also go on to earn a degree and right. it's not going to, you know, put them into destitute or poverty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And, and, and meanwhile, like the, the one point I want to make sure folks are hearing is because uh, I it's another interesting counterpoint I think to Varsity Blues is that even though I think the problem is much more serious and maybe uh, you know raising awareness around the problem is one of the the key uh, really points of, of of unlikely as I understand it I think the other aspect though is it's hugely inspirational both in the, the stories of the students who are overcoming these things, these, these challenges, and also in terms of the, the, the spirit of innovation that uh, really sort of permeates the, like everybody who's, uh, who's interviewed and is contributing to this. So I'd love to, I'd love to maybe pivot in that direction too. Yeah. So like, um, whether it's LeBron James or uh, obviously I have to begin with the King, <laughs> uh, but, but whether it's the I Promise School, uh, Nancy Cantor, I mean, like her story is, is really riveting. Michael Crow, we mentioned um, the list. I mean, I'd love to hear maybe a few examples of some of the some of the thought leaders you you got access to and some of the approaches. Um, it's almost like a you know, it's actually like an interesting um innovation documentary too because like you know you're looking at a lot of different approaches you know you identify the fundamental problem and then you go into a very uh like sort of in-depth exploration about the solution from the perspective of the narrative of these these five students uh you know I, so i'd love to t to 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 hear hear y'all talk a little more about um some of the the varied approaches you encountered, some of the inspirational folks uh, who were part of the film. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, of course, starting with the king. We, yeah. we were, what we what we really were looking at was Akron, Ohio. Yeah. Um, so Ohio has you know struggled in a lot of different ways, and one of the things that you know you look at is the education. And it was really interesting to hear to talk to people in Akron about the struggles that they had in um, you know elementary and secondary education. Um, but there was a big push in Akron um, that to to make sure that the students there are getting post-secondary degrees and getting certificates and, and moving forward in their life. And so it wasn't just LeBron um, that we focused on, but of course he's, you know, he's a superstar. And so it yeah. was, um, but it was also the whole city that we were looking at. Uh, one of the cast members is there and, you know, we wanted to show what the university is doing and what the city is doing and what the public or the, the, the private sector is doing. And then of course the foundational side, which is, which is LeBron. And so, you know, he, he stepped up and said, before he even started his school, he said, what I want to do is everybody that goes through my program, which was being run in different schools at that time, um, it has the opportunity to go to the University of Akron 100% free. And so mm -hmm. the, it was kind of this like idea where it's like, you know, other people haven't been able to step up. They tried for a while in Akron to get, uh, to get free college for every student that graduates from an Akron public high school. But they couldn't get it, and so LeBron stepped up, and and he and he said, anybody that goes through my program, I, I'll go ahead and give them a free scholarship. And school. I think what's really interesting is that this is you're looking at an ecosystem. So you're looking at a city and a community that values the idea of post secondary education. And so you have LeBron, who himself didn't go to college, right. but he recognizes that that's important for the the kids in his community to have the opportunity. And so that's what I think is really transformative is that, you know, the city's all in on this and mm -hmm. you have someone, and I think every, not every city has a LeBron James, but every city does have individuals who are invested. And I think that the message that we hope you get out of the film is that it's not just higher education. This is higher education alone is not going to solve this. Right. You know, a single individual, we, you know, LeBron's not going to change college graduation rates across the U.S. Um, but it's really all of us going all in and doing what we can in our positions of power and leadership and saying, this is something we value in our city, in our community, and in our country, and doing what we can to, to create those, um, those innovations and supporting and celebrating the programs and institutions that are, you know, making those strides and putting adult learners and, um, you know, students coming from marginalized backgrounds, uh, making them their education a priority. And there's a one little line about from this LeBron James, this this student that we followed there for a little bit, that she she talked and it's it's people will almost hear it and be like they giggle at it and it's almost a throwaway line. And what she says is when we heard that, you know, when when we heard that he announced that we got free college, I turned to my friend and I was like, We gotta get smart. <laughs> and it's a funny line, but then the bottom line is that changes what we're saying to a student is yes. College is no longer this pie in the sky because we, when we talked to, when we worked with First Generation, our last film, we talked to a lot of students and it was, students knew two things. One, that you had to go to college and two, that college was too expensive. Yep. That's what you knew. So if you change that narrative when you're, when you're talking to students and you don't say you have to go to college and it's too expensive, but you just say, hey, college is after high school and there's lots of options and we can absolutely make it affordable and everything is going to be fine. Right. Then, then the idea is we got to get smart. We can work hard to get to that. Mm -hmm. And that is something that changes the whole idea of a city, of a country. If we can put that in people's mind, that it's not going to be too expensive. The idea that it's not worth it, that stuff, if we can clear that out, then we can make that road a lot easier for, for young students. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, well, like you were saying, we, we did look at other, uh, a lot of other programs that are more geared towards today's students. So mm -hmm. we looked at the Starbucks college achievement plan that's based through ASU and Michael Crow and Howard Schultz um, came together and built that. Uh, we looked at uh, a competency based um, education plan that is through Southern New Hampshire University um, called College for America, which is working with employers. And so it's mm -hmm. a very public private partnership, um, a, a fantastic uh, plan to, to help students get a competency degree um, from an accredited university, from a nonprofit university that is helping these students uh, do it online and at home and through their employers, which is really fantastic. Um, and we also looked at Georgia State, um, and that is kind of the, the way that they've been able to manipulate 
all of their information that they have on the students and help those students, every single student that walks through those doors graduate um, mm -hmm. and really raise their graduation rates and all the great work that they're doing there. We also looked at Year Up, which is um, it, you know based in, in community colleges across the country, and some of them are even outside of community colleges, but that is helping students get through, through a year of community college, get technical degrees, um, and certifications and help them get an internship which gets them right into being able to get a job mm -hmm. and i think that that is a program that needs a lot more like it is it is spreading and spreading but we need to we need to push it up there a lot because these students that get accepted into those programs and be able to get through it they they literally have life changing experiences um because and even if they don't finish their their degree, their associate's degree, or their bachelor's degree, they have a technical degree that they can walk away with, and they say, "Now I can go do these these things." Mm -hmm. So it's it's you know there are great programs out there, and I think the problem is we're just as a country we're not focused on it. All we hear is like, yeah. you know, why yeah. does why does this college cost too much? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you talk through the the innovation that you focused on, I want to ask you a question about the storytelling aspect of it all. Uh, you could have probably had a documentary just on the graduation rates, right? Just focusing there and, and staying there and sort of staying in the negative space. How important was it to you to tell that full arc and, and hit on the, the aspirational and, and what's growing and where we can go as you were putting this all together and, and hit on those innovations that you just hit, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, you see a lot of documentaries that stay in that negative space and you sort of leave the theater and you're like, oh my gosh, like, there is no hope. <laughs> like, how are we ever going to surmount these obstacles? What can we do? It's just, um, or the, or do you see these ones where like the hope is like, well, there's this one little program that may yeah. be starting somewhere yes. that's just like, here we go. Like this one could work, but, mm -hmm. but we wanted to show a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. And so I think we wanted to show, first of all, we wanted to give people hope. We wanted to give students who are watching this, um, you know, something that they could access and a program that may, that possibly existed, you know, where they worked or lived. Um, and so that it wasn't just like, oh, in Akron, Ohio, this is happening, um, but just sort of show the expanse. And I think that we often talk in education about how the system is broken and we complain about it, we lament about it, um, but we don't necessarily take action or we say like it's too difficult or it's too hard. And so um, we heard even talking to Michael Crow, he says when we were interviewing him, you know, it's he's like a lot of um, a lot of schools and institutions are afraid to innovate because, you know, they've been doing things a certain way. And so, um, you know, that those stories of innovation uh, need to happen, but they need to be celebrated. And so <clears throat> I think that that's what we wanted to do is we just wanted to celebrate the innovation that's happening and in a sense, challenge others to step up. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you say Georgia State, you know, um, you know, got rid of any sort of inequality in their graduation rates that they improved. And, um, you know, low income first gen and students of color graduating at the same rate as everybody else. That's sort of a challenge to another institution to say like, hey, we did it. Can right. you do it? Um, so I think that's what we're really doing is sort of creating this call to action because we want to see change happening across the country. Yeah. And, and I really like how you are trying to reframe the conversation. This is where, you know, one of the villains uh, in the in the narrative here is the, the college ranking system, which uh, uses maybe 20th century metrics, you know, yep. like it, the US News and World Reports launched that in the 80s. And, you know, you, you go into depth on the criteria they use to identify the, the tippity top schools, but the majority of us aren't gonna go to those schools. And- oh, yeah. And like, and it's actually damaging to, to sort of, you know, in this, in this age of like inclusion as something we're more interested in as a society, or at least I hope we are, uh, this notion of exclusivity and the more exclusive you are, in some ways, there are tactics that the schools, the, the elite schools adopt to kind of game the systems because they're, they're, they're kind of caught up in this, this ranking game. Yeah. And, yeah. um, it just made me think about the power of opting out of that frame. Yeah, yeah. particularly if you're at the you know you're at the back of the line, you're not really going to get in. Whether you're the university, you're not going to break the top fifty, you're not going to break the top hundred. 
like the the level of courage it takes yeah for those I mean, tools yes. to shift you know yeah yeah exactly and what we need is those top 50 schools and if those top 50 schools are listening just stop filling out that report that they send you yeah just stop filling it out and here's and the stop bragging about uh, your rankings so that's cool. the i think that the, it becomes this cycle because when schools brag about their ranking it just perpetuates this idea especially among alumni i get you know, emails from Columbia all the time saying, please donate to our schools so that we can maintain, you know, our spot in the rankings. Right. And that just, for me, I'm like, that is just not motivating. It's, it's like the worst give. reason the, yeah, to ask worst. for money. It's like when you get, when we get those emails, I hear her in the other room, just like, ah, oh, I got another email. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what in the, like, I just blows me away that people have graduated from the school and the reason why they want to give money is to make the uppity ups think that their school is uppity up. I mean, well, that just is it's ridiculous. It just creates this culture of elitism, which mm -hmm. is, again, it goes against this inclusivity, but it, it makes higher education seem you know, like a Veblen good, you know, it's right. this like luxury product, which is the, you know, opposite of what the mission of higher education should be. Exactly. And so, you know, so that's troubling. But I also think that the way that we talk about rankings, is like one through 100, you know, I know that it's expanded to more than that, but as if institutions, there really is like a number one school, like that's right. such a myth. Um, right. You know, even when I worked in college admissions, we would never tell a student that there is one best school. We we're always talking about fit. You know, it's about, there's, you know, different types of schools for different students and you need to find the one that's the right fit for you. Right. And, you know, and there's several of them. There's going to be lots of schools where you could be happy, but, um, but we're perpetuating this idea of a number one school when that's just like not even the reality. So I think it's a very um, troubling myth. And I think that we really should shift. I mean, I think we should take a cue from the way we rate movies, you know, here in Hollywood with like Rotten Tomatoes, you know, it's right. you get, there's, you know, there's like a five-star rating system and, you know, there are lots of great movies out there. I think, you know, obviously we would get, get into an argument about what's the best movie, but I think we can all acknowledge that there are tons of great movies every right. year and there are tons of great schools and so if we just you know rated schools um you know based more on that sort of system i think it would be much more helpful to families and to students as they're trying to navigate the space and it also would you know stave off things like operation varsity blues where people right. are like yeah you know we need to get into these top schools right. and the stress that goes along with it and the anxiety and the truth mm -hmm. is like we don't we we blow a lot of smoke over at uh at at, at the u.s news and world report but it's not their fault mm -hmm. it's really because there are lots of ranking systems out there and brian kelly will say hey i don't care whether or not you fill out the paperwork or not brian kelly's the editor or i don't care if you fill out the paperwork this is a consumer-based thing we will put you on the list if we want to put you on the list we'll put you where we think you go right and the 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 problem isn't them the problem is the schools and the parents and everybody that cares so much about it Right. Because if there are lots of ranking systems and if you were, you know, if you'd never listed your name as like a top ranked school anywhere, if you never bragged about it, then it would it would completely get rid of how much people what? read this and care about it. We need to we need to tell the schools it's this to start at the schools and to the parents and say, stop reading this, stop right. buying this, stop, stop promoting this, stop talking about this. And hopefully U.S. News and World Report will will just go away. <laughs> yeah, but I think the problem is U.S. News in the sense that the metrics that they use oh, to totally. measure are wrong. And so yes. I, don't, I don't think you can That's look true. at it and say like, oh, it's not U.S. News as well. I think they are, They do measure by the way terribly. that they're measuring what they're measuring. I mean, you have other things like Washington Monthly or, um, yes. you know, the, the New York Times Social Mobility Report, which right. is looking at different, you know, really transformative, um, you know, measurements of like, sure. you know, where does a person move from one socioeconomic level to the next for right. after having gone to college. So that's true. U.S. News and World Report. Basically they measure inputs as opposed to outputs. outputs. Yeah. 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 And, and I, di I didn't want to go break too bad. So but but I, I, I thought it was <laughs> we go on. We just do a whole thing on that. We could just talk about it all the time. But uh, but but what I thought was interesting, like we we talked about the, you know, you know, the whole concept of FOMO we've uh we've also explored the the concept of jomo like the joy of missing out uh <laughs> it was it was actually uh it was in our uh march madness brackets last uh last spring and it did pretty well uh but it was sort of the idea that like you know if you buy into sort of the scarcity conversation and you buy into there is one best school rather than there are a few 
really great options for me and my family, or maybe even many really good options for me and my family, I think you just start to turn the the whole narrative on its head, like you were saying yeah. before. And um, and I thought that was really eye opening for me. And I also think it was um, important to identify those populations that need different services. Mm-hmm. And like in some ways, the the more uh, quote unquote selective schools, by virtue of not having that many students who need those services in their uh, in their student body, they don't have to spend as much time on it. But if you're like an urban campus in in Newark or downtown Atlanta, like you you have to you have to address these problems. And and I was just really. Uh, appreciative of the fact that you took the time to shift that focus. And, um, and it's almost like, to your point, like the other metrics that are out there, the other ways to evaluate schools that can educate parents better and students too, because sometimes these students, first generation kids or kids from tougher backgrounds, it's really, they're, they're more on their own. They don't really have a family to support them making these, 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 these types of decisions. I just think a lot of it is almost a shift of, the shift of our frame of reference mm-hmm. seems like the yep. most fundamental takeaway uh, from uh, from what I got out of uh, Unlikely. Any thoughts on that? I want to do a whole podcast on Jomo. <laughs> good, good, good. You've you've come to you've come to the right place. Yes, I love that idea. I yeah. I'm the, Steve, once you started talking about the joy of missing out, my head just started spinning over here because I love that idea. Yeah. By yeah. the way, I mean, just on a side note, I'm like, I feel like that's the idea of like. If you put your phone away for the weekend, oh. it's like it freaks you out for about you know six hours, and then all of a sudden you're like, "This is freeing! Really? This is fantastic! Yeah. Like I yeah. feel I feel so wonderful that I don't have to have mm-hmm. this fear of like what else is going on." Right, right. So yeah, if you if we can change that frame of reference in people's mind, if we can if we can really start to to think differently about what we're what we're pushing, what we're talking about, what we're saying is number one and number two and number three and all of that and say, look, this is, there's lots of options out there. There's lots of ways to get a degree. It's not necessarily a BA. It's not necessarily an AA. It's not this school or that school. It's not local or far away. It's not any of these things. The point is that we want to prepare people for a career and for a life after high school. And that is, you know, looks so different in so many different ways. And if we can give that all that information and we can continually send more information and, and feed parents and students with this with these opportunities, then that that idea of like, oh my gosh, I just got to get to this. And if I don't get to that, then what about this one? And what about Mm -hmm. that one is going to go away? And it's going to be like, let's find what works best for each student. Mm -hmm. I know. I love what Freeman says where Freeman Hrabowski Hrabowski at UMBC, you know, he's like, it shouldn't be a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that therein lies the challenge, I think, because, you know, higher education operate has, has operated often in silos and, you know, hasn't changed, but I think the difficulty is that we need to, you know, innovate and change and it can't be, it's not the same for every student. And the students today have, are so different from what they were, Mm -hmm. um, you know, even a decade ago that it's really incumbent upon higher ed to innovate and figure out, you know, how do we serve these students? How do we talk about college in a way that is, you know, 21st century thinking as opposed to the way it just has been? Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's what students want too. Yeah. That's, yeah. I think that's what they crave and they're looking for. And I mean, we could go into the whole like, oh, tangent i mean it's like you look at the like the mental illness and the the things that people are the depression and anxiety mm-hmm. that students today are dealing with at all levels and i think a lot of it comes from this um you know just, just this pressure to compete and this comparison and you know things like ranking systems are perpetuating that i, I really feel strongly about getting away from from that i think it, it could it's good for the health of our our country and the health of our our the students. Yeah, it, re- it reminds me of uh, Todd Rose's book uh, out of uh, Harvard Harvard Graduate School of Ed, uh, The End of Average, uh, which which talks about the the dangers of ranking individuals or comparing them to to an average. And uh, you know the the hook line there is you know it's a one size fits none uh, right. mindset. Right. And like that that does feel like 
like in many ways you're talking about the counterpoint where like there are different sort of ways to tailor your educational career over your full lifespan and like there's a lot of innovation happening it's something we're trying to cover on this show uh i, I think you do a wonderful job uh covering it as part of uh unlikely i, I recommend it highly uh you know to all of our listeners i know we're we're coming up uh on time uh dan any uh any uh, bring her home uh, kind of questions here for, uh, for, for us all? Well, I think the, the good one is always what's next, right? So is it a revisiting of some of these subject matters or is there something else in the works that we can look forward to from 3Frame Media? What, what, what's next? That's yeah. a great question. <laughs> we, are, we are in the middle of that right now. So we have one project that we're just finishing up right now, which is completely away from education. And this is a uh, uh, short form docuseries that is about small businesses in America. And that will actually be released next week. Um, yeah. yeah, by the time yes. this podcast comes out, I think it will actually be coming be out. out. Yeah, be it's coming called, out. It's yeah. called awesome. Saving Maine. Hmm. Um, and uh, it was it's actually presented by American Express and it's about small businesses in America and the struggles hmm. that they go and why we need to support them and making sure that we're saving our main streets. Hmm. Um, so that's a, that'll be coming out. Um, so yeah, get, go ahead. It'll be savingmain.com. We'll be, we'll be ready to go in the next couple of weeks. And then it's, it's funny, Adam, you said it's not educational based, but we've taken pride here on the show of sort of getting outside and talking about lifelong learning and, and growth yes. mindset and the idea of it sounds like entrepreneurship and yes. businesses. Yep. There, there's a lane there for education. There, so you know, we, we, we want, we want to bring you back is what Dan said. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy we to come that. back and talk Happy about it. Happy to come back. We're really, yeah. it, we're really excited about it. It's a very yeah. cool little series that we did. And uh, we, uh, in the same way, we got to talk to a lot of experts, some of which didn't make the cut into the films yeah, but we the talked about Kaufman to, Foundation yeah. Victor Wong at the Kaufman Foundation and, and anyway so that's what's there and then uh we have a few things in the works uh for next documentaries and plans and and other other things that we're hoping for and we'll have some we're actually um doing some shorter versions of unlikely so we're doing a policy version that will be coming out um soon um, we're doing a one that's just focused on parent learners mm -hmm. and and then another short just on the georgia state story so those mm -hmm. will be released um throughout uh, probably in early 2020 so along with some of the foundations that we're that we've been partnering with and so those are those are going to be coming out we're really excited that hopefully those will be shown at some uh you know speaking engagements and and uh we're as the as the 2020 election is is ramping up we yes. hope that the film is <laughs> is there as a tool for people to talk about higher education and make sure that that's part of the zeitgeisty stuff that you yeah. talk about. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> All done. Adam and Jay Fenderson, thanks so much for the time. Hey, Thank thanks you very so much, much, guys. Glad this to be awesome. here. Find uh, more information at unlikelyfilm.com. Also on Twitter, you can find them. Uh, information abounds uh, throughout social media and on the internet about this film. I really enjoyed it. Mike recommending it as well. So check it out when you have the opportunity and check out unlikelyfilm.com. As always, find us on Twitter at Trending Ed. Same on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash Trending Ed. And finally, trendingineducation.com. Thanks so much for listening, as always, to Trending in Education. Mm -hmm.